Hi there, this is Igor Yangin at Vedem Crit. So imagine that you work at an emergency small animal clinic and are presented with the following canine case. It is a nine-year-old spate female mixed breed dog with a body weight of 10 kilograms. Her name is Lily. She became lethargic and started vomiting in the last 48 hours. In addition, she has been panting a lot and developed polyuria and polydipsia about a month ago. On physical exam, she has a stuporous mentation, heart rate of 140 beats per minute, hyperemic mucous membranes with capillary refill time or CRT of two to three seconds, strong femoral pulse, respiratory rate of 80 breaths per minute without any effort, and estimated dehydration of about seven to 8%. As part of initial assessment, you performed venous blood gas, with electrolytes and renal values that showed the following results. Her pH is 7.31, bicarbonate 18.1, venous partial pressure of CO2 37, sodium of 160, potassium of 3.5, and her blood glucose is very high at 765 milligram per deciliter, 42.5 millimoles per liter. Her creatinine is 3.1 milligram per deciliter, 274 micromoles per liter and BUN is 85 milligram per deciliter or 30.4 millimoles per liter. In addition, a point of care serum ketone level was evaluated and it was 0.9 millimole per liter. Based on this initial information, would you diagnose Lily with diabetic ketoacidosis, hypersmolar hyperglycemic state, or combination of DKE plus HHS? Let's spend a few minutes discussing what HHS is and what its diagnostic criteria. HHS, or hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, is a form of diabetic crisis characterized by severe hyperglycemia, usually greater than 600 mg per deciliter or 33 mm per liter, with minimal to absent urine and or plasma ketones, and serum osmolality greater than 325 millismol per kilogram in dogs or 350 in cats. Diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA and HHS are both forms of diabetic crises. They can be viewed as different manifestations along the same spectrum, as evidenced by the fact that some veterinary and human patients present with a combination of HHS and DKA at the same time. However, there are distinct features of HHS that differentiated from DKA. Veterinarians must be aware of these differences as they may impact clinical management. First, patients with HHS have just enough insulin to prevent ketogenesis, but not to control hyperglycemia. Therefore, HHS does not lead to profound ketonemia and severe high anion gap metabolic acidosis that normally develops in patients with DKA. That said, HHS may be associated with high nine gap metabolic acidosis caused by uremic acidosis and or hyperlactatemia. The second difference between HHS and DK is the presence of profound osmotic diuresis that leads to reduced glomerular filtration rate of GFR and low GFR further exacerbates severe hyperglycemia, leading to worsening osmotic diuresis. As a result, patients with HHS may develop hyperglycemia that is as high as 1,000 to 1,500 mg per deciliter or 55 to 80 millimoles per liter. Another notable difference between the two diabetic crises is the fact that patients with HHS normally have less insulin requirements due to the lack of significant ketogenesis. And normalization of the intravascular volume and GFR is the number one priority in their initial management. To diagnose HHS, the following criteria must be met. First, blood glucose level should exceed 600 mg per deciliter or 33 millimoles per liter. Second, there should be no or trace amounts of ketones detected in the urine or plasma. If a portable ketone meter is used, the ketone plasma concentration should be below 2.5 millimoles per liter. Third, the calculated serum osmolality should be greater than 325 millismol per kilogram in dogs or greater than 350 in cats. It is important to note that some papers advocate for calculating a so-called effective osmolality to diagnose HHS 
as opposed to irregular osmolality. When calculating effective osmolality or tonicity, urea or BUN is excluded because it freely crosses cell membranes and thus does not contribute to water movement between the intracellular and extracellular compartments. Regular calculated osmolality is the total concentration of all solid particles, including urea, in a solution, and it is typically estimated using the following formula. 2 times sodium plus glucose in milligram per deciliter divided by 18 plus BUN in milligram per deciliter divided by 2.8. On the other hand, effective osmolality can be approximated by the following formula. 2 times sodium plus glucose divided by 18. The division of glucose and BUN by 18 and 2.8 respectively converts milligram per deciliter to millimoles per liter. If millimoles per liter are used to measure these values in the first place, this conversion can be skipped and the formulas will then look like this. Is effective osmolality better than regular osmolality? To my knowledge, there are no studies that showed any clinical differences between the two formulas. One thing of note is that it is important to use the same formula when monitoring these patients over time. It may be more practical to use the effective osmolality for serial monitoring since it does not require measurement of BUN and is based on sodium and glucose levels only. The final criterion for the HHS diagnosis is the blood pH. In HHS, blood pH is normally greater than 7.3 and bicarbonate is greater than 15 millimoles per liter. However, this may vary depending on the comorbidities and the presence of severe renal impairment that may drive uremic acidosis. In addition, veterinarians must remember that animals with diabetes mellitus may develop a mixed HHS and DKA state when changes that are characteristic of both types of diabetic crises are present in the same patient at the same time. Now, let's go back to Lily and evaluate her initial blood work together. First, her BG was 765 milligram per deciliter or 42.5 millimoles per liter, which is way above the 600 milligram per deciliter cutoff. Second, her plasma ketone level was 0.9 millimoles per liter, which is below 2.5 and is not sufficient enough for the DKA diagnosis. With respect to her plasma osmolality, her total osmolality was 160 times 2 plus 765 divided by 18 plus 85 divided by 2.8, which equals 392.9 millimoles per kilogram. Her effective osmolality was 160 times 2 plus 765 by 18, uh, which equals 362.5 millimoles per kilogram. This degree of osmolality elevation is consistent with HHS in dogs. Finally, her blood pH was 7.31 and bicarbonate 18.1, and these values are not low enough to diagnose DKA, and they're more consistent with hypersmolar hyperglycemic state. So the final conclusion is that Lily has developed HHS, characterized by severe hyperglycemia, increased plasma osmolality, and only minimal ketosis. So how would you manage this patient in the first four to six hours? As I mentioned previously, the top priority should be denormalization of the intravascular volume and GFR, while the insulin therapy can be significantly delayed. Other important therapeutic goals must include the following. First, gradual decline in hyperglycemia with target goal of 50 to 75, up to 100 milligram per deciliter per hour, decrease in blood glucose, which is about 2.5 to 4 millimole per liter per hour. Second, resolution of hypernatremia with target goal of about 10 to 12 millimoles per liter per day or 0.5 millimoles per liter per hour. Third, a reduction of serum osmolality by approximately 3 to 8 millimole per hour. The overall rate of decrease in osmolality is more important than the individual decreases in sodium or blood glucose levels. Acute drop in plasma osmolality may lead to potential complications such as cerebral edema. In Lily, it will be reasonable to start sodium chloride 0.9% for initial fluid resuscitation and correction of dehydration since it contains 154 millimoles per liter of sodium. With her body weight being 10 kilograms, her initial fluid plan may look something like this. 
First, you can consider giving a 10 to 20 mL per keg fluid bolus of NaCl.9% or normal saline, since Lily is tachycardic, has tuberous mutation, and prolonged CRT, which may indicate the presence of hypovolemia. Afterwards, she may be started on the total fluid rate of 83 mL per hour that is based on 7 to 8% dehydration being corrected over 12 hours plus maintenance rate. It is reasonable to assume that she has severe asthmatic diuresis resulting in ongoing losses. Therefore, the fluid rate of 83 mL per hour may be bumped to about 100 mL per hour, so by another 10 to 20 mL per hour. Since Lily is hyponatremic at 160 millimol per liter. She can also be started on free water supplementation from the very beginning once your fluid bolus is finished. NaCl.45% or half strength saline will be a reasonable choice since it doesn't contain dextrose that this dog may not tolerate without insulin supplementation that we're not going to do in the first few hours. Alternatively, the free water supplementation can be delayed for another four hours when the sodium will be rechecked again after she received initial fluid therapy. Let's say an attending clinician in this case decided not to supplement free water and account for ongoing losses. And Lily received a 10 mL per kg NACL.9% bolus that resolved her tachycardia and she was started only on 83 mL per hour to correct her dehydration and provide maintenance. Four hours later, her body weight hydration status effective osmolality, blood glucose, and electrolytes were rechecked. Serial monitoring of these parameters is crucial in management of HHS patients. The recheck results were the following. Her body weight dropped from 10 kilograms to 9.8 kilograms. Her hydration status remained the same at about 7 to 8% dehydration. Her blood glucose dropped from 765 to 571 milligram per deciliter, or 42.5 to 31.7 millimoles per liter. Her sodium increased from 160 to 163 millimoles per liter. And her effective osmolality decreased from 362.5 to 357.7. In other words, decreased by about 1.3 millimol per hour. Based on these recheck parameters, it is obvious that Lily's initial fluid plan was inadequate. She lost weight instead of gaining weight. It is very likely that her osmotic diuresis led to massive losses of fluids that exceeded her fluid intake. Also, the in increase in sodium and inadequate drop in effective osmolality tells us that she definitely needs additional fluid supplementation that will include free water as well. So, what would be a reasonable next step? in addressing these concerns. First, you could consider placing a urinary catheter and start urine output measurements to monitor her ongoing losses more closely. However, frequent body weight measurements may be sufficient in some cases without the urinary catheter as well. Second, her total fluid rate should be increased by at least 20 to 30% and then adjusted based on the measured urine output and the body weight trends. And finally, the free water supplementation in the form of NACL.45% of half strength saline should be initiated. All right, I hope you enjoyed this case as much as I did. If you want to learn much more and master small animal electrolyte and acid base disorders, check out the Venom Crit Academy by clicking on the link below located in the description section. Bye bye.